Uh, my name's Colin Solon. I'm with uh, ConventionScene.com. Hey, Colin. Uh, I was wondering, so what is the challenge as a voice actor uh, when you're doing a, a dub of an anime versus creating a character from whole cloth and being the first one back? Well, with when you're doing anime, it's somebody else's vision. Somebody, somebody's already voiced it. Somebody's already animated it, and you are constrained by the timing of the beat when that first lip flap starts to when the when it ends. So, as an actor, you're sort of constrained by the timing of someone else's performance. Now, what you do within that, it's like what's the difference? You know, the distance between two points is infinity, and you kind of have to think about it that way. Otherwise, you're always going to feel like I'm so constrained. So, you really do have some leeway in between and it's really sort of a fine art to be able to finesse the ins and out of it so you don't end up talking like this you know uh which is done very well for our fabulous mr shatner who we adore deeply but it's uh it you know to try and make it sound natural and fluid within uh, the constraints of someone else's performance is always the challenge and i feel like that's that's when you need a really good writer that knows that I've got to pause here, I've got to pause here, and then I've got to continue and then pause one more time and figure out how to break up a sentence or a thought or a moment and still have it sound fluid and natural within those constraints. When you're doing prelay or original animation, uh, you are usually only constrained by your own imagination at that point. When we, uh, I direct Tangled the series and when we have you know, Mandy or Zach come in and they just they get to play and they really don't have to be constrained by anything else other than where we feel the character needs to go. But it's a very collaborative effort. So in terms of timing, uh, it's a much different experience. So, you're welcome. Hi, I'm Samantha Ferrer from In My Health. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Your hair is fabulous. Thank you. <laughs> uh, as someone's been in the industry for, for so long, what would you say has been the biggest, most substantial change from your perspective? I think probably the technology. When I first started, uh, that I even like if you talk to Barbara Goodson or Richard Epcar, they're like, well, when we started, there were no beeps. But like I started when there was beeps. Uh, <laughs> but we were doing everything analog in terms of the technology. And then it switched over to digital, and Pro Tools became a part of the equation, um, which meant we, as, as a director, uh, I had a lot more flexibility in terms of taking these constrained moments and messing with them. I could take two separate takes, chop them up, especially uh, when we did Cowboy Bebop, uh, we would do three episodes over two weeks. So we would record for a week and a half and then, or a week and two days, and then I would have usually a day and a half to two days to QC the whole thing so I could watch it and say, ooh, what other takes do we have there? cut up takes, put them together, stretch it if it wasn't long enough so you can really finesse the lip sync to make it look like it was animated for English, which I feel like is always the challenge for dubbing, is to try and make it look like this was actually animated uh, for whatever language you happen to be dubbing it into, whether it's French, Spanish, uh, English, or whatever. Uh, so I think the technology has really benefited uh, the industry a lot. It's uh, been able to let us really fine tune uh, shows and moments and performances uh, that we just didn't have time to do in the past because of the analog. It's like if it didn't work, if you mess one, one word, I'd be like, all right, let's start over. Do it again, do it again. And you may not be able to capture that lightning in a bottle that you had for that initial take. So uh, you gotta go back and do it again and again and again. So the technology is really, I think, made the biggest difference. And the amount of content, to be honest. There's so much out there. And I mean, cross the board. People come up to me and like, have you watched Wild Wild Country? I'm like, where are all these shows now? It's just amazing. So I think what's great is that there's so much more product out there now because the technology has made it a lot easier uh, for people to uh, create their own vision of new shows. And, you know. mm -hmm. Hi, I'm Lynn Kelly from Nerd Caliber. And Based on my cosplay, you can probably guess what kind of questions I'm going to ask. Cowboy Bebop. <laughs> no, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> and uh, going off of your most recent role as Queen Metallia. Oh, yeah. You know, you're, you know, you're a villainess in this one. In a strange way, do you ever feel like you relate to, a, you know, in this case, a villain? Because I know a lot of voice actors will find um, that they relate to characters some way or another. But oddly enough, do you ever find yourself relating to this character? <laughs> So you're asking me if I'm a terrible human being, is what you're asking me. Yes. 
And the answer is yes. Uh, <laughs> no, I don't know. I think there's something about playing villains. I just played uh, Governor Price in Star Wars Rebels. And she had such a clear vision of what she wanted. And I think most villains do. There's usually very little conflict in uh, a villainous person. Uh, they know exactly what they want, and they're usually going to do whatever it takes to get it. And uh, the difference between the characters would be how they go about getting whatever it is they want, whether they you know, like to. Governor Price was very fond of torture, for instance. Uh, Queen Metallia was just sort of this uh, presence. And uh, I think there, it's easier to make choices, strong choices with villains, I think. The hero is always conflicted. There's always conflict on the journey of the hero. So I think in that respect, it's, 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 it's more difficult to get in there and really find yourself within a character because you have to know sort of the whole arc of where the character's going to go. Uh, so I think in terms of relating, I, I have a lot more conflict in me than, uh, than the villains that I play. Um, but every now and then I get to play someone like Motoko from uh, the Major from Ghost in the Shell, who also had a lot of conflicts and everything else, but she was such a strong character through most of it and being in charge that it was easier for me to dive in to the net, ha ha, to dive in to her shell, as it were, uh, ha ha ha, um, ba -dum um, than it was uh, for like Noriko or, or for other characters that had a lot more conflict, so. Yeah. Thank you so much. You're welcome. And yes, I'm a terrible person. <laughs> uh, I'm CJ Mappers with TunamiFaithful.com. Hey! Oh. Hey, Tunami! That's probably the best reaction I've gotten from anyone I've interviewed. Even Steve? <laughs> he was gracious, but I was very uh, enthusiastic. Oh, that, I, I love Tunami. Most of, most of our stuff would never have been seen were it not for Tunami. When we were doing Bebop, I just thought, well, nobody's ever going to see the show, so let's just do it for us. And then when it finally got exposure, you guys were, uh, uh, you're necessary to get our, what we do out there. You and know? it just keeps on airing. Yeah, <laughs> over and over. I'm curious, though, about Ghost in the Show, considering your role in it. Yeah. How did you feel about the Hollywood movie that came out recently? Oh. I don't know if mm. you have talked about it. I don't know if you have any opinions at all. But I am curious, considering you were the voice of the major, how you felt about it and you saw it. Well, you know, there are a lot of, how many people have played Batman? How many people have played Superman? So I think for one person to say, and I wasn't the first major. First of all, the amazing actress from Japan is the one who originated the role. And then I think Mimi did it in the first movie. And then I took over. Uh, and now there's another actress in Texas doing a rise. So for me to lay claim, or really anyone to lay claim for anything but Zara in critical role for me, that's the only character I've ever created. So um, I love Scarlett Johansson. I think she's one of the greatest young actors uh, of our time. I, I just adore her. And I knew uh, just from her past work, one, that she could handle the physicality of it. Two, she could handle all the intellect of it because she, after Lucy for me, I love Lucy, uh, she could obviously play someone incredibly intelligent. Um, so I thought visually it was stunning. Uh, I had some issues with uh, stuff, but you always do. I mean, it's hard not to, if they ever do a Cowboy Bebop series, I'm sure I'm gonna be sitting there going, why, why, why would you make that choice? And hopefully at the end of the day, I'm gonna love it, you know? So uh, I don't believe any actor should be able to say, that's mine, that's my voice, I am the original, you know? I mean, it's just like, yeah, you're the original, but eventually you're gonna pass that mantle on to someone else. So uh, I, I applaud her for her performance and for, the movie. I mean, anything that can get what we do out to a bigger audience is great. Because if someone sees that movie and says, what is this based on? And then they'll go back, hopefully, and see the original animated, uh, or the, the movies, and Ghost in the Shell, the series, Get Sack, everything else. So anything that can bring them closer and to, to connect all of these nerd worlds of joy, I'm all for it. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Hi there, my name is Evan Borgo. I am from the Boston Bastard Brigade. Hey, <laughs> the Boston Bastard Brigade. Bastard's by name, not by reputation. Got it, love it. 
and also the host of the No Borders No Race podcast show where we promote Japanese musicians and alternative artists as well. Oh, cool. How so, fun. The anime that made me a fan of anime was Outlaw Star. Yay! And while it was a supporting role, Hilda is the character that initiates the adventure that the main characters are about to have. I know it's been a bit of a while, but can you discuss your time recording that role and how you captured both her toughness and her level-headed personality? Well, the thing about anime is that we don't get the scripts beforehand. We can't see it beforehand. At least we couldn't back in the day. Um, so 100% I rely on my director, and that director was the incomparable Wendy Lee. So I relied 100% on Wendy's guidance, and she led me through that amazing world and that amazing short uh, time frame that Hilda happened to be there, you know? so. And usually it's, you only get to see the moments that you're in. So in terms of the broad picture, I had to completely rely on Wendy. So it was a fully collaborative effort between me and her. And I love working with Wendy. So I'm very grateful that she cast me, or Yutaka Maseba and Kevin Seymour cast me in such a small but pivotal role. It's, it's kind of nice to sort of come in, you know, a little bit and just be like, and then leave, you know? I mean, it's, <laughs> it's nice to have those moments of, you know. Uh, play a pivotal character that doesn't have to spend the whole time, that just comes in a little bit and then goes. So, yeah. Thanks. Hi, I'm Andrew Fleming from Wicked Anime. And Wicked. My brother from Wicked Anime, Jonathan Fleming. Uh, Who's older? I am eight minutes. Eight minutes? <gasps> identical twins. Yes. I'm an identical twin. Really? I'm six minutes older. Uh, um, Sorry, I know we're supposed to That's not a question, but. <laughs> To say the most inappropriate thing at the most appropriate time. <laughs> I told Andrew Lloyd Webber how much I loved his work on Les Mis. So that'll give you some idea <laughs> of that superpower. It and, happens uh, all the time. And just like everybody has a favorite Batman, you're the, you're the favorite major. Oh, um, yay. Thanks. Know. But uh, I asked the same question to Steve, and I'm going to ask the same question to you as well. Uh, what is the worst job you have ever had before entering the anime industry? Oh man, I worked in this bar where I had to spin the wheel every 15 minutes to see what's the special! And it was just, it was so degrading because nobody's paying attention to you and I just sort of felt like this reject Vanna White. Okay, let's spin it! You know, and I'm not perky. I'm not someone to get up there and, hey everybody, let's check out the clam sauce! You know, I'm, I just, it really wasn't me. Um, so yeah, that was that was pretty crummy. So yeah, but the spinning the wheel was you know I mean how hard is that? Any idiot they could have had a monkey in there doing it. I mean it was just like nobody and the monkey would have been smarter than me at that point. So uh, yeah, it was really stupid yes. and degrading. Yeah, so yeah, it's fantastic. What did Steve say? Uh, Steve uh, had three, but one of them was... Was the fire extinguishers? No, that was the first one he told, but I think the worst one came to when he was picking up the used condoms on the parking lot. Well, that... Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good time. That's a good time. Yeah. Yep, the dream of Hollywood, man. What's your dream? Yeah, good times. Oh, another terrible one. I was a Jägermeister girl. Oh, right, collective groan. So that was like so, and I remember, oh, there are no kids in the room. I remember going over to Barney's Beanery and, you know, in the little awful outfit that you're in, and I walked up to the curb and some guy pulled his car right up in front and he was doing something to himself at that moment. And then that was, then I went to Barney's and these two women just started punching each other. And I was like, <laughs> This is my last day as a Jägermeister girl, ever. So yeah, that was, but that was when I was trying to be an actor. That was Hollywood fun. Yeah, good times. Doesn't match the condoms, but it's, it's pretty close. And on that note, hi. Hi, I'm Alexandra, I'm from the Geekly Grind. Hi. Um, hi. Uh, how does it feel to be honest and open about your love for Dungeons and Dragons on Critical Role? I love it! I love it! I want to roll this d20 right now. Um, here's the thing, I never knew what... Uh, oh, this feels really good. Uh, I never knew 
Like when I was a kid, nobody I knew played Dungeons and Dragons. I sort of heard like a rumor of it, and I was like, "What is that satanic thing happening?" Uh, but it was never. Nobody ever did it out in the open. Nobody ever talked about it. So I never played until I got on Critical Role. That's the first time I ever rolled. Well, the first time I, I rolled a die was at Patty's while Matt and I were trying to come up with my stats for Zara. But after that, then I realized, well, this is improv. This is improv, and you have to say, instead of saying yes to the exercise, you have to say yes to the die. So once you roll, it's just like, and I go to hit the dire wolf in the flank with my sword in hopes to kill it. Roll, you roll a 20, and you kill it, and you become this great warrior. You roll one, and you get your leg bitten off, and you have to say yes. It's so great, even when it completely foils your plans, and you realize, oh, okay, well, I wanted to do that, but that didn't work. And how good you roll sometimes is how your character is developed as well. So I just think it's fantastic. And it's, it's a great way for, in a, in a world where every, in a world, where everybody is playing video games or on their phone alone, uh, to actually get people in a room together or on the internet together to problem solve and improv as a group I think is fantastic. So it's this collective world building with problem solving and stupidity and fun and all of these problems that you must solve can be related to the problems you have to solve in the real world. It's all a metaphor. So I think it's fantastic and it's an unbelievably empowering experience. I mean, I talked my way out of having sex with a, a frog king last time <laughs> by altering self into the frog queen and talking like Bane. And I woke up the next day and I was like, I can do anything, you know? I mean, it was, and the day after Rhyme Fang, that next morning, the week in between uh, the first and second uh, time when we were, you know, when we had to deal with the frost giants on Critical Role, I spent the whole week going, when, would mass suggestion work? What if I tried mass suggestion on it? You know, and people are like, you gotta get into the booth. You, you get, you know, Zach Levi's waiting for you. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Hey, Zach, do you play D&D, &D and do you think mass suggestion would work on frost giants? And he was like, oh, Mary, you're such a nerd. And, uh, and he loved it, and I love, yeah, I just think it's fantastic, and I think, it's weird, isn't it weird for a while? It was like Texas Hold'em, and there was all this card playing. So, and that was on for like 10 years. Like Texas Hold'em was the thing. And it's all about sort of competing against each other and being sneaky against each other. And now what's sort of on the rise and what's huge right now is this creative game playing, you know, uh, which can be either a positive or a negative thing depending on your choices. But I just think it's fantastic. And it's getting, and it doesn't matter how old you are. You, you're, if, if I am a lesson in anything, it's that you're never too old to do anything. To create something, to pursue a dream, to fall in love. Steve and I got engaged in September. So you're never too old for anything, you know? So uh, I think D&D is fantastic. As Matt says, I love D&D. <laughs> so yeah, I do, I really do, I wanna play. I wanna play right now. Roll for initiative. Oh, I'm a DM. You are? Yeah. Oh, there's some games going on this weekend. I know. <laughs> I'll come find you. Thanks. You're welcome. Uh, kind of sparking off that, um, what's your perspective of the, how anime culture, fan culture, convention culture has kind of exploded in the past 10 to 15 years? Well, I think it's amazing because I think people who sort of uh, are growing up well, look, I mean, we're all, we all get bullied, right? I mean, most of us at some point or another for liking something that someone else thought was weird. Well, this is weird. And you can come here and fly your weird flag as high and as proudly as you want. So this is a place where people come, hopefully, to not get bullied and to enjoy their love for something that isn't necessarily mainstream. But the more you realize it, the more you realize that, like I've met scientists who are like, oh, I love, I grew up fascinated with the technology from Ghost in the Shell. NASA bases most of, uh, a lot of what they do on what Gene Roddenberry dreamed of, you know? So <clears throat> I feel like it's always kind of been there, um, but it's not like taboo anymore. Our, our friend Bobby Hall, who's a, a rapper named Logic, uh, got in touch with Steve to be on his album because he loved Cowboy Bebop. So all of a sudden they're at New York Comic Con and there's Logic and Steve up on the stage and you can see the two different factions, right? The rappers 
and the anime nerds, you know, and, and animation and Toonami nerds and everybody else. And all of a sudden you saw this sort of coming together like, oh yeah, I know that show. Oh, I love that song. So I, I, I think the world's, the veil between the worlds is getting thinner and thinner as it should be because we're, there's sciences involved in all of this now as well. So, um, and I think people are getting a different idea of what it's like to be an adult too now. I don't know, at least I am. Yeah. Hey, uh, honestly, after your Yeager yeah, Girl story, I have to ask this. Okay. What is the craziest thing that's ever happened to you in the recording booth? Oh, well, it's usually some sort of bodily fluid uh, or bodily function. Um, <laughs> Let's see, when I was, uh, I was brought in on Halo to do one of the characters that just gets beat up. I'm basically just there for your beating pleasure, as it were. And they said, uh, all right, we're gonna set up a thing, it's a sound set, and you're just gonna parrot, and it's like, we want you to just match what the guy did. And just, I said, okay, well, how many of them are there? He says, there are about 35, 40. I said, okay, well, if you just put them with like a second in between, I can, you know, parrot it back. So if he's going, ugh, I can go, ugh, huh, huh. And it turns out it was Steve that I was parroting at the time. And we got through about 30 of them. And I think probably around there, during one of them, I farted. Uh, and I looked into the booth at everybody else and everybody's still marking off stuff. And I was like, Nobody caught it. Uh, 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 and then and we finished like I said, we good guys? And like, yeah, that was great. I said, okay, thanks. So now I know that I farted in Halo. And there's something very <laughs> exciting about that and wonderful. Yeah. Yeah, it's uh I mean everybody's funny and everything else, but it's usually I've had uh actresses when I was directing them. Uh, their water break. I've had two uh, ready for pregnancies. I've had one pregnant who's like, I just need a bucket during in between takes. I'll just throw up. And I'm like, okay, that's good. But that's not embarrassing. That's just, that's the beginning of life and wonderful things. But yeah, but farting is usually it. <laughs> uh, considering that Ghost in the Shell has returned to Tsunami, it's been on multiple times, things like that. How do you feel about the show's overall legacy, especially considering it did get a Hollywood movie? seems to be a fan favorite of a lot of Toonami fans. I think it's amazing. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's, it was so ahead of its time in terms mm -hmm. of, and we're, we're smack in the middle of it now. It's, it's, uh, well, it's, it's the Jurassic Park, you know, just because you can doesn't mean, does that necessarily mean that you should? I mean, if you can create a body to put a soul or a ghost into, what does that do to us as human beings? Uh, with the advancement of technology of not having to sit in a room with anyone and just be able to do this all day long, we're missing the tactile part of our existence. So what is that doing to us psychologically? And I feel like Ghost in the Shell captured a lot of those uh, questions that uh, at what point does the science of what we can achieve uh, get in the way of our humanity or will it continue to flow together like a, a DNA spiral at some point, you know? Or are we just going to make Tyrannosaurus Rexes and we'll be gone in a couple of years, you know? <laughs> Who knows? Yeah. yeah, it could. But I think the technology of the situation really brought up a lot of moral issues and ethical issues about humanity that have been around forever, you know? I mean, it's, uh, it's, it was just told in a very unique way. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. So, I was very happy to hear you voice the action news anchor, Dynamite Watkins. Dynamite Watkins! In OKKO. OK yes! Yes! So, as the show gets animated, after you record the lines, you know, the complete opposite of dubbing anime. Yeah. Did that give you the chance to add something to Dynamite uh, and her personality within the recording booth? Yeah, without a doubt, because she's sort of a mix of Diane Sawyer and a world-class wrestler, right? So I could play around with and choose the moments of when to go into wrestler mode, when to go back to the Diane Sawyer mode, and, and uh, they give you a lot of freedom. It's just so much fun. You really feel like you're playing, you know, and, and especially because we do okay with uh, usually all the actors in the booth. So that one big episode, which was all, uh, and I think... Um, uh, the whole cast was there, so we got to really play off each other, and that's something you don't get to do in anime or uh, when you're working solo, is that there's magic that happens between actors, uh, especially if you get people that start to feel very comfortable and confident and who can improv. 
oh man, the stuff you'll get is just gold. It's really fantastic. So you sort of end up feeding off of each other and encouraging each other within the booth. So yeah, she was great. She's really fun to play. I hope to see more of her in future episodes. Yeah, well, I think she just came out with a game. Like She's the lead in one of the Dynamite Watkins games. For It's a, it's a game on your phone, an oh, app. Really? You know, these kids and their apps, something like that. I don't know what it is, but yeah, 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 yeah. So check it out. So within the world of being nerds and fictional stuff, we tend to find ourselves falling in love with fictional characters, which we call the phenomenon of waifus and husbandos. Yes. Do you yourself have a height of waifu or husbando? Or Spike both? Spiegel. <laughs> From tell that to Steve day. he wasn't sure. <laughs> He knows exactly. I've said it so many times. So much so that when I was, it was my first job directing, so I didn't know what I was doing. And it was Steve's first lead, and he says he didn't know what he was doing. So we were kind of stumbling through this together. And uh, the more I watched uh, Spike, because I got to hear and really get immersed in the Japanese version as well, uh, as I was preparing to direct it, I was just watch it over and over and over again, and I fell in love with the Japanese actor who played Spike. But then Steve came in, and, and I was like, oh, what? You know, uh, okay, that's real good. If we ever see Julia, I'm playing her. You know, it's just like I became obsessed with Spike yeah. Spiegel. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, he's so badass, he's so, wonderful and conflicted, and he's got this past that you don't know about. He's just sort of the, the bad boy, you know? But with, you can tell that within there is a lot, is a very deep well, you know? So, yeah. Yeah, he was beautiful. I love Spark. Love it, great. <laughs> How did you make the jump from voice acting to voice directing? Uh, uh, they called, they asked. I, uh, I went to, I got a degree in theater in college and then I went to grad school in Texas because I was too scared to get out in the real world and I didn't want to go back to New Jersey. I love New Jersey, but I, I just didn't feel like my future was there, so I delayed my entrance into reality by going to grad school for an additional three years. And uh, I did a little bit of directing. I don't think I even directed in grad school. I did in college. I think I directed one play. And um, when I started working for Zero Limit Productions, they had uh, Wendy Lee, Leah Sargent, Bridget Hoffman, Kevin Seymour. So they had a lot of directors. But they, the company grew so fast that they had too many shows and not enough directors. And the week before they called, I went on my last on-camera audition and it was such an awful experience and degrading and I just remember looking up and saying, I know I'm supposed to be here because I'm here, but I don't think I'm supposed to be doing this. I've been banging my head against the on-camera door for years with limited success, but I'm here, so I must, I'm supposed to be here, please give me a sign. And the next week I got a call about Bebop. And they said, do you want to direct this show? And instantly, I was terrified. I was like, I'm going to fail. And so I instantly knew I had to do it, you know, because anytime you get a challenge like that, you've got to say yes. That's how you end up jumping out of a plane, you know. You get some great experiences that way. So that was it. They asked. And then they showed me the opening sequence of the tank, and I was like, wow. I turned to Kevin, and I was like, why aren't you directing this? Because he was directing, he directed Akira and Ghost in the Shell. And he's like, because I'm too busy, Mary. Had I known, you never would have gotten it. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, I love you, Kevin. So uh, yeah, so they asked, and that was it. And that's when I felt like, oh, now I'm starting to understand what they were trying to teach me in graduate school about character development and using the voice. And things started to come into place. And I felt so much more at home than I ever did on camera. And I continue, and still do, continue to do voice acting. And the more voice acting I do, I feel like hope the better a director I become and the more directing I do I hope the better voice actor I become so uh, there it's a very wonderful symbiotic relationship between being able to do both so, yeah um, so when you're working with actors um, it seems common nowadays that a lot of actors who are primarily known for their on-screen work or yeah. go get in, into voice work do you ever find a particular challenge in like having to train them how to how to uh, work differently when? Yeah. Uh, uh, 
without you know using facial expression. Oh yeah, that's the thing. It's just all of a sudden you know it's it's I can see. What I, I, what I find most is that voice actors who primarily do voice acting are always on the page, and they're always sort of in there and reading, and, and, and they're, they never look at me, but when, because I usually end up reading, as a director, I'll read with the actor, because I, I always feel like if you play off of someone, you're going to get a more natural response, because the base you know, line of what acting is, is listen, respond. That's what we do all day long. That's all it is. Uh, so if they have someone to respond to, and I find that they'll memorize lines and we'll be acting with each other like this, but they'll look at me with the eyebrow and I'm like, okay, I love it. I can't hear that eyebrow though. So put the eyebrow in the voice because we can't see it. Uh, we can animate it and we will, but put a little bit of it in the voice. So it's definitely a learning curve to get people who are uh, more used to using their physicality to uh, just using their voice. It's, it's a very specialized skill, and uh, it usually takes a little bit of adjustment. People might come in with a little sort of lower energy than they normally would, and Diedrich Bader, who's this amazing voice actor and on-camera actor, says, when you think of animation, always start 10% more energy than you normally would on screen. Just start there. And you're usually pretty good, even in the intimate scenes. You know, I mean, it's just, just raise it up a little bit. And I think that uh, most people aren't used to doing that if they're just used to doing on camera, especially if they're theater performers. That's a whole different thing. Tangled's cut where you have so many Broadway people on Tangled, and they're just instantly, yeah, you know. And then sometimes we have to yeah, pull them down a little bit. But I find with on camera actors sometimes, especially if they're done, you know, a lot of intimate stuff, they're used to being very quiet and very low key and everything is like, okay, that's great. That's what we want for the scene. Just up at about 10% and then we'll go from there and you know start to carve their way into that. So I think after a while they find it's really freeing uh, because they don't have to worry about what they're wearing and hitting a mark and looking off somewhere or you know making sure they found their light or anything else. It's all we do is focus on the voice and building a character through the voice. So after a while, they're like, this is great. You're just playing in here. And it's like, yeah, I mean, it's work. But it is. It's, it's a, a very freeing experience. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, growing up, when was your, not your Rika moment, but like, when did you realize that you wanted to be a voice actor, that this was the route you wanted to take? Or was there ever really a moment where you knew you wanted to, you were just going to work with the flow? Or? Well, when I was a kid, I mean, I, I watched too many cartoons all the time. My dad would come home and put his hand on the TV and say, would you stop watching cartoons? You know, because I'd come home and Thundercats would be on or, um, I mean, I just loved cartoons. And it was his fault. He sat me down and said, look at Bugs Bunny. You're going to learn about music and Shakespeare and timing and everything else. And I just said, okay. And uh, so I don't think I ever saw it even when I was in, you know, because I was theater, I was Shakespeare, I was, I was, uh, I never, it never occurred to me until, it yeah, mm -hmm. like I kind of, I kind of just walked into a door facing the wrong way and had no idea. And I realized, oh man, this is, this is fantastic. And it really, because you can't really make a living on anime, the, the contract, the, it just doesn't pay enough. Um, but then I got into directing, and I was like, oh, this is what I want to do. I want to let go of the on-camera, and I want to focus on voiceover in the sense of the whole shebang. Directing, acting, singing for like Silent Hill and stuff. So that's, that's where I felt comfortable. That's where I found a home and my community. Most, a lot of people find that in the on-camera world or in the theater, and for me, that's that's the community that opened their arms to me. So I, I ran in wide open. Yeah. Thank you. Sure. Uh, considering your reaction with uh, where, I, where I run for the Toonami people, you seem to be a fan of the block. Yeah. How do you feel that it's been around for so long, especially being able to influence not only fans, whether they're older, but now with this new iteration with younger fans, it's yeah. to kind of keep animating the forefront on television, too. I think it's amazing. I hope it continues to go and grow and 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 because there's really there's is there an anime network? Is there a I mean it's like really streaming now. 
it's all streaming and it's on Crunchyroll, but you know, I want to be able to not have be able to sleep at three in the morning and turn on the TV and it's just like, oh, Boba Bo's on it, you know, or something <laughs> weird, you know, or wonderful. Um, and so many of my friends, it's like, I just sort of sit, I get to sit up and I have a diff slightly different perspective because I get to listen to my friends act. You know, because we all did it together, and it was a really small community of people that were doing it at the time. So, so I love it. But what it's doing now is that it's opening uh, the eyes of a whole new generation to what has been the old stuff and the new stuff. You know, like Attack on Titan and Hunter. Is it Hunter versus Hunter or Hunter, something? Hunter, Hunter. Hunter. Uh, daka, daka, daka. Uh, so <laughs> it's. Uh, <laughs> um, I think it's great. I think it's it's wonderful um, because it's not just for kids, you know. I mean, there's a, there's a lot of uh, American animation that is for adults, but it's a very sort of like with Archer or The Simpsons or American uh, that um, this still has. I mean, it's all comedy based and it's sort of arch and it's wonderful and it's funny, but. Anime still tells very complex stories in uh, that runs in a different direction. You know, that's more adult theme, that's more dramatic. Um, so I, I think it's terrific that it's all there. You know. Sure. So one question I'd love to ask our voice actors. My favorite swear word. <laughs> so we have this thing called Beach Cut for Island. Basically, it's if you found yourself stuck on a deserted island, which three characters that you have played in the past would you like oh. to have with you to keep you sane until your imminent rescue, and why? Well, let's see. Uh, Erd, Hilda, and, uh, let's see, I think, Erd, Jura, and uh, Helba, because they can all fly. And I wouldn't be on the island for very long. <laughs> Unless we wanted to be there, you know, which is good. That way you get the option to stay as opposed to being forced. But people who can fly, yeah, 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 why not? Zara might be fun to have there, too. We'd always have a nice warm fire if we ever needed one. All right, um, so uh, what is, what, or who do you think is the sexiest character you have ever played? Oh. Uh, I don't know. Um, geez. I mean, the earlier stuff, like Erd and Jura, were pretty bombshell alicious. You know, these are women that hadn't seen their feet for a couple of years, if you know what I mean, because they're very well endowed. Um, uh, and they could fly, and they were all, you know, <laughs> tits akimbo, as they used to call it. Um, uh, I don't know. What's your definition of sexy? You know, um, the most provocative voice, or like the most alluring, or maybe even. I don't know. Well, I think physically, one of those two. I think in terms of being a a complex woman, I think the major is just because she's badass, but she's also got vulnerability in there as well. She can take care of herself, but she also has to question things at time. So I think she's the most well-rounded woman, um, but uh, yeah, I don't know, it's hard, it really, it depends on what your, what the definition is. I guess the one who wears the least amount of clothing, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know. I was going to say Spike, but I never played her. Um, uh, a character I didn't play, I thought Faye was just phenomenal, Faye was just so complex and, and coquettish and wonderful and uh, always cool, I would imagine. Usually never hot because of the very lack of clothing. Um, but I don't know. Which one? What do you think? Well, it would have to either be the Major or Kurt and I. Yeah. I loved Kur and I. I kind of feel like, man, she gets pregnant. Like, we'll put her in the house. I'm like, she's this all-powerful genjutsu casting and you're going <sighs> to... <laughs> Come on, people. It's nice that she's watering plants, but, you know. Yeah, I loved Karina. She was great. So what has your experience been like as a woman in the entertainment industry? Well, I have to say that in the animation world, I feel like an actor and a director, not a female 
actor or a female director. Uh, when I was doing on camera, I could very, I very specifically felt uh, the pressures of gender. Uh, but for some reason, and look, I'm not the most girly, feminine thing out there anyway, right? I've, I'm sort of strong, and thanks to playing the major, I've become this sort of strong, you know, uh, not to say that that's not feminine at all, but it's just, I'm going to dig myself a real deep one on this. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, in being in the animation industry, I, I think we see ourselves as actors because uh, we don't have to be constrained to only playing women. Uh, we can play men. I've played a number of men uh, over my career, which is really fun. Uh, I had the great honor of, of working with Pat Carroll, who played Ursula, and uh, she got to play uh, Falstaff on stage, and I was so blown away. I was like, wait, you mean women can play that? I want to do that too, you know, because there's some great roles that uh, I would love to play someday. But for some reason, I think the animation world is much less about what gender you are uh, and more about what voice can you do, what character can you create. So I think we kind of are in this, in a, uh, a place that isn't, I mean, look, sexism is everywhere and, and uh, racism is everywhere, but for some reason when we come to work, we come to work on our characters. I'm not coming in as a female director, although I'm proud as hell to be one, but for some reason the animation world has more female directors than I think any other part of the industry. So uh, I don't think they see us as one or the other. It's what do you bring to the party? What do you bring to the table? You know. So I, I think that's wonderful. I wish that would happen more and more. Definitely, that's awesome. Yeah, it is. It is. There's so many female directors in animation. It's fantastic. So, yay. Speed round. Uh, do you have any great like convention stories that you pull out for like this one time this thing happened? Um. I don't know. See, I work in a booth all day long, and, and you know, I barely get to see the sun. And then we come, and I think it was, it might have been here, it might have been Anime Boston, that I was talking, I was still smoking cigarettes at the time, and I was standing outside one night, and these two girls, and we came up, and we just started talking, and I, and I knew that they were fans, and they were sort of really excited at first, and then by the end, they sort of calmed down, and we were just talking and having this great conversation, probably for like half an hour, and then I got in the elevators, because it was really late, and I had to go to bed, and uh, and the girls came up in the elevator and everything, and, 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 uh, <laughs> and I said, well, this is my floor, and they said, okay, well, it was really nice. I said, it was so nice talking to you guys. They're like, yeah, me too, thanks, have a good night. And I got off the elevator, and the minute the doors closed, uh, ah! I just screaming, and I was like, you guys, I just sit in a room all day. You know, it was, so that was sort of a weird, I call it the Sally Field Paramus Mall from Soap Dish moment. Uh, and the other one was the hairiest human being I've ever seen in my life came up without his shirt on and said, sign me. And I was like, I can't even see the skin through the forest at this point. So it was like parting. I was like, do you have a comb? So that was always uh, fun and interesting, yeah. Sure. All right. What would you be doing today if you hadn't gone into the entertainment industry? Dead. Uh, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I think now, maybe politics. <laughs> um, I don't know. The world's getting crazy. So uh, I've my dad ran for governor of New Jersey in 1980, and after that experience. Uh, I promise I would never, I hated politics and I would never get into it, so I've tried to stay away from it, but the current series of events has led to me wanting to sort of get a little bit more active in making sure that people's voices can be heard. So, Courtney Taylor, J.P. Karliak, two other voice actors, and myself, this is actually Courtney's idea, are starting something called Nerds Vote, and the whole purpose of Nerds Vote Hashtag NerdsVote, NerdsVote.com, we're putting the website together now, is to get people registered, young people especially, who may not know 
how easy it is to register or who may have been moving all over the place as young people do so they may not have registered now so the most and it's nonpartisan it's just to get people interested in the process and to get people's voices heard because I think a lot of people think that voices their voice doesn't mean anything or that their vote doesn't mean anything but that is not the case 100% if you've looked at the past elections all over the country you realize how close these elections are so if you feel passionately about something if you care about the world around you get out there and vote because nerds need to be heard and I am a huge nerd and we need to support people getting out there and voting yeah because this is our country they work for us damn it <laughs> I think they forget that so we need to have our voices heard as much as possible and what the hell we make all these great amazing awesome choices in imaginary worlds it's about time we started making our voices heard in the real one Thank <laughs> you.